Now, the miracle at Mara kind of sets the stage. It was a miracle that was apparently designed to be two things. It was designed to be instructive, and it was designed to be a test. That's what it says in the text. It also says that in Psalms 81 when it says, I tested you at the waters of Mara. Mara. And so it was designed literally to be a test. And when you begin to unravel what had just happened, it makes sense that God used it as a test. Uh, it's like a, a real life parable. And we don't know if all the parables are actual stories that actually occurred. May have, I don't know. It just doesn't say, you know, it's a story, it's a story. It's like believing, if you believe, you know, that every preacher's story is true, then God bless you. So, so we don't really know. We don't know. But this is a real life story, and it's like a parable. And one of the interesting things about this is how it kind of displays how God treated Israel different from Egypt. He clearly indicated that he was in full support of Israel and not Egypt. He just saw that clearly with ten plagues. And so as far as the Egyptians were concerned, the Lord that they didn't know was just a God that was about smiting people, you know, if you didn't do what he said. But from Israel's perspective, all he was was a God of grace and mercy because they didn't deserve to be liberated either because they had fallen prey to most of what was wrong with Egypt. They would given themselves over to much of that. They, were, they didn't even know who the Lord was either. Remember when Moses came back? They're a little confused, and if you don't believe that they were confused, just read through the wilderness wanderings. They struggled heavily with their faith. So they weren't much better than the Egyptians, so it wasn't because they were such great people or such a big nation. It was because God was gracious and he made a promise to Abraham that this was beginning to happen, and he's fulfilling his promise. So there was a difference in the way that God dealt with Israel and the way he dealt with Egypt. And that becomes really clear through this. And it, it looks like, you know, well, you just know that you ought to follow the Lord. But it's a little more complicated than that. And it doesn't quite work out that way where it becomes obvious. Well, you follow the Lord and you keep everything you've got and you don't follow the Lord and ten plagues gone on you. That's not the way the world works and that's not the way the Lord works. What's interesting to me is that God has a surprise for us all. So he's just delivered Israel by these ten plagues. And then he divides the Red Sea for them. And they walk across on dry land. And you just think, boy, God is with you. Nothing can go wrong. Now, we all want that to be true. okay? And we want just... I've given my life to the Lord. Everything's going to fall my way now. So what's going to happen? Well, a rock's going to split open and water's going to pour out. I'm going to get bread from heaven's going to fall on me every night. I don't have to work again. That's what we want to happen. We want there to be signs in the sky and making it clear what we should do. But that's not what happens in this text. What happens in this text is God divides the Red Sea. They walk across. God's with them. Egyptian army is destroyed. And what happens? Uh, walk one day into the wilderness. It's dry. No water. Walk two days. I was just talking to Crafton about walking through the desert. And they only had like a half mile to go. And they were worried about not having enough water to get back the half mile. It just, just a short distance in a desert without water is dangerous. But they walked the second day and no water. And they walked the third day and no water. Now, folks, that's dangerous. I don't care how you look at it. It's just dangerous. It is at a point of dying three days without water. I don't know how they made it. Maybe they carried some water with them. I don't know how they made three days. But they did. And so now it's like, okay, so we've, God's going to come through for us, and now there's water. Now, I want you to think about not being able to drink anything the rest of this day and anything tomorrow. And then somebody offering you some water the next night. Uh, would you drink it? 
Would you drink it if it was sulfur water and it tasted a little bitter? I'd drink it. Three days, I'd drink nearly anything they put in front of me, okay? If I've been walking through a desert. But this water tasted so bad, they couldn't drink it. Now think about it. God's been with them and now nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay, finally we got water and it's so bad, that thirsty, they couldn't drink it. What's God doing? He's testing them. He, and it's a surprising test because we're in amazement at the deliverance and we don't think this is the kind of thing God does. But this is the very thing God does in each and every one of our lives. He does it every time he turned around. So they were, they were in thinking, well, the Nile, the water was sweet. Yeah, we were slaves, but we were alive. And believe it or not, you can think crazy thoughts like that. That you would rather be a slave than die of thirst or drink nasty water that's so bad you can't stand it. Now imagine that, and that's where they started thinking. It's very strange. They were in slavery, but they had sweet water. And now they had freedom, but they had water they couldn't drink. Which way would you rather be? That's the test, wasn't it? That was the test they were facing. And the Egyptians had plenty of water. In fact, they had so much water that it drowned their whole army. They had enough to spare and a whole lot more. But they didn't have the water, so they, the Egyptians were rich with sin. But now Israel was in poverty, but with salvation. Now the truth is, is that every single one of us has known the pinch of not having enough. At some point, you have that pinch, and it's a test every time. If right now you've got uh, more money than normal, God bless you. If you've got too much money, I feel sorry for you. But, but most of us would, could use just a little bit more. And if you're going through a pinch, that happens to us all. It's going to happen to you if it hasn't already. So this is a matter of testing. God surprises us all the way. He deals with his people and then he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten every child that I receive. So you think, why does God do this? It is the only method he's got virtually at times to test us out, to see if this is real faith or not. Who are we really? He's testing what was in their souls. You see, there was... He took them out into a dry place because their souls were dry. He gave them bitter water because there was bitterness in their hearts. You don't believe that. You start reading through what they really were like and what they really did. And they were not at all the people that you imagine them to be, these great spiritual giants. That's not who they were. God showed them that they had to taste this bitter water so that they begin to realize, hey, they need to get away from the bitterness. Egypt's wealth did not save them. They died and they lost just about everything. But here's Israel finally out of slavery after 400 years and they're thinking about going back. Now slavery in America lasted about a hundred odd years. Could you imagine going back to it? For anything? and yet over a cup of clean water that would taste good and a few pieces of food, people would do crazy things. So I'm just suggesting to you that there's three ways that God proves, as he says in this text, I am the Lord that heals you. And just look at those real quick, and then the lesson will be yours. Oop, that's, fine. that's it. Number one, he heals our situations. If you're in the text, Read again with me, just 22 through 25. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out in the wilderness of Sur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah, and the people complained against Moses. And if you complain against Moses, it's really a complaint against who? 
the good Lord, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it in the water, the waters were made sweet. I wonder what that tree was. You got any idea? I got nothing. Uh, they, there he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. So fainting Israel thought Marl was going to quench their thirst, and they couldn't even drink it. So a thirsty man, even though he'll drink nearly anything, this was snatched away from him. So, you know, imagine that. I want to drink, I want to drink. There it is, there it is. Finally you get to it, and you put your face in the middle of it, and it's like, I can't drink so often, we see blessings we think we're going to get, and they're snatched away. Have you had that happen? You were looking for something, just knew that was going to happen, and that got snatched away. It was more bitter than you could stand. They began to murmur, like I said, against Moses, but really that's a murmuring against the Lord as if he's done something wrong. And that's where we go. We almost think the Lord doesn't know what he's doing at times. What are you doing? In fact, we'll ask, Lord, what are you doing? Like he doesn't know. Sometimes a trial can literally be too much if it comes after another trial. So if this had been right on the heels of another trial, it may have been too much. But the truth is, this is on the heels of a great victory. And yet, notice how quickly they're ready to pitch it all in. It's funny how we are. Things can be going great. I mean, ten plagues, God's on our side. We're marching away through the Red Sea, and now God's left us. There's, there must not be a God. I mean, you just, you fall apart. But God has often healed your bitter waters. Do you not remember? How many situations have you been in that turned sour, and he healed that? Now, how can he do it? They may not remove it. You want him to remove it. I, just, I don't want this one. I want some other water. But he often doesn't remove that. What he does is he adds something to the bitter situation, and it becomes okay. He puts some new ingredient in, right? And all of a sudden, it's not so bad. There's a new opportunity put into the mix. Or there's a new medicine that maybe is going to get you well. Or there's a new person at work, or you get a new boss. You hate your job, but suddenly you get a new boss. Whatever it is, suddenly there's a new ingredient that this terrible situation becomes able. You can, you can drink it now. You can live with it. So he prov proves that he is the Lord that heals you in this first c concept that we need to just get. Your situation may be bitter to you, but it may be only testing you. Hello? It may be testing you to see if you can understand that the Lord can take that bitter situation and make that sweet. And he did. The second little truth that I want you to see is that he heals our sicknesses, not just our situations, but our sicknesses. Verse 26 is a great text. And said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight. Give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes. Now, I got to tell you, that's a tall order. All of his statutes. I've never done that, but I'd like to think I had. Right? Um, but I'm afraid I've failed on that. I will put none of the diseases on you which I've brought on the Egyptians. Now, the, the Egyptians um, had had some diseases. I mean, it's clear. Israel had seen Egypt die. Their firstborn just died. Something killed him. I, I know it's an angel, but it's likely a disease. I imagine that he gave them or something like that. So they saw their firstborn saved from that. So in a very real sense, they've already been delivered from a disease that the Egyptians got. And here's the truth. We're redeemed. You and I, are children of God, we're redeemed. But that's our soul. Our bodies have not been redeemed yet. I mean, you're still running around with the same body you had before. And it doesn't want to do what the Lord wants it to do. You've probably picked up on that. That's the reason we get a spiritual body. I don't know what that means exactly, but I do know that a spiritual body wants to do what the Lord says. 
Okay, so that body will do what the Lord. But our body has not been redeemed yet. It will be redeemed. That's the argument of Romans 8, verses 18 through 23. The revelation of the sons of God. One day, this body that's been made subject to all the problems we've got now and doesn't want to do what the Lord wants it to do and dies on us, gets sick on us and dies on us, one day we'll have a body that doesn't get sick, doesn't die. So it is going to be redeemed. Uh, we're born again but not our body. So disease and sickness are meant to do something, apparently. Apparently it's meant to make us homesick for heaven. It does that for me on occasion. Haven't you done that? I mean, things go wrong so bad in your body, you're like, I think I'd rather just go on and be with the Lord than face what I'm facing right now. Yet, the Lord doesn't heal our bodies in every circumstance, and we end up, and we do die. But, that's not what he's talking about here. The first thing he's talking about here is the best form of healing there is, which is preventing you from getting sick. Now, which would you rather be? Healed from a sickness or never sick? Now, think about that just a second. If I'm getting in one of those two lines, I know which line I'm getting in. Amen? Uh, prevention is far better than a cure. If you're never going to get a disease, I want in that line, right? Don't you sometimes pray, oh, Lord, please don't let me ever, don't let me ever face that? You haven't prayed that prayer? Yeah, I bet you have from time to time. So the test of prevention is in this text. He says, I will put none of the diseases on you. So I'd rather be prevented from getting sick anytime. But here's the strange thing about that. This is really weird. If you don't get sick, that's a blessing. Amen? Praise the Lord. Most of you are well right now for the most part. Amen? Praise the Lord. Amen? But you know what happens? We forget that we're well. Until you get sick and you just like, <coughs> you know, and you just, I don't know if I'm going to make it, Brother Dutton, you know? And then the Lord heals you, and you get well. First thing you want to do, get to church. Oh, your tears will well up in your eyes. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm, right? You're just so grateful. Send cards out to everybody. Sent you a card. You're thrilled. But what's really upsetting is you've been blessed with health day in and day out, and barely will come to church sometime to even give a thank you for being well. And this is the first promise of the healing. There's some kind of healing going on in your body right this minute. You got little something and others in there, I don't know what they call them, corpuscles or something. And they're working just over time trying to keep you well. Right at this moment. If you're shaking a hand at anybody here, something's going, there's something on my hand. I don't I gotta stop that. If you breathe something, somebody sneezes, your nose is up there saying, there's an emergency up here. We've got to fix this. And it's working right now. Your bloodstream is cleaning stuff all through your body. You got stuff going on, keeping you well at this moment. When's the last time you said a hallelujah for that? When's the last time you got down on your knees and says, Lord, thank you that today I wasn't sick. I didn't wake up feeling terrible. Now, you do that after you've been sick a little while. You go, oh, Lord, thank you that I can breathe. I remember last year when I got pneumonia twice. That second time, I thought I was going to die. And when I started breathing again, that's all I could think about. I still do that. I say, Lord, oh, that feels so good. Thank you, Lord, that I can breathe. Amen? Yes. I just don't want to go that way. So, and, and how many people do you know in this congregation that's had cancer and doing great right now? Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. But you know what's better? If you ain't got cancer right now. Now, you didn't say oh, hey, a big amen on that, but that is even better to never get it. You know, oh, I had heart trouble and now I'm fine. You know what's better? To never have heart trouble. I had a broke leg. What's well, better not to get a broke leg? Amen? I'm the Lord who heals you. So, uh, when we have been ill and we recover, that's great. But most of all, won't you just say a little thank you if you're doing pretty good today? Amen?
because he says he keeps those things from you to some degree. Now, that doesn't mean that you've done everything right because that's not what he's saying in this case because ain't nobody ever kept every one of his commandments in here, okay? But if you're fortunate enough, you're not sick right now, you ought to thank the Lord. And if you're fortunate enough to be sick and the Lord's healed you, then you're making my third point, okay? He heals our souls, our souls. Not somebody else's, ours. We all get in this line. Every last one of us gets in this line. He says in verse 26, For I am the Lord who heals you. When I read that the first time, I'm like, What in the world does he need to heal you for if you don't get any of the diseases? And then I realized, because nobody actually keeps all of his commandments anyway, and then you get sick. Everybody gets sick, but there's another way of getting sick. Clearly, the Lord knew that there was another way of getting sick, and that is sin sick. I'm going to break the commandments. So I'm going to get sick physically, and I'm going to get sick spiritually. And I've been sick both ways more times than I can shake a stick at it. So the Lord made a promise, even when I do disobey, and even when things go wrong in my life, and I become ill or whatever, He's still available. I am the Lord who heals you. None of us are perfect, so you're going to need it. Since we all sin... That's a good promise to hold on to, isn't it? None is righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 and then verse uh, 23. So it is with sin as it is, it becomes something that will become bitter to your soul. Uh, Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Now here's something you need to get in this story. The Lord could have gone around this way. He could have found water that was pure. Okay? But it was important. Not this that a scout go ahead and find bad water. It was important that every single Israelite get so thirsty they would taste that water. I guarantee you every last one of them tasted it. I ain't trying. John says, oh, it ain't worth drinking. I'm like, three days? I'm trying it. Okay? They tasted it. Now, why is that important? Because every last one of us, my brother and sister, listen to me, needs to taste and see that sin ain't worth it. It's bitter. We've all got to have that bitter taste. Because it's the same thing. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Every last one of us, if you're going to be saved, have got to say Take a taste. You've got to find out. Every one of us has got to taste that bitterness and find out. We must find out for ourselves. Nobody else can tell us. Oh, they'll try. We have Sunday school classes. Teachers get up, tell our little kids, oh, don't do it, kids. Don't do it. And, of course, none of our, all of our teenagers, excuse me, I almost said that wrong. All of our teenagers listen to us, and none of them sin, right? And none of our young people go out and sin. Because we taught them at home. I've seen parents kind of full of themselves. Oh, our kids turned out wonderful because we did such a good job. Like your kids didn't sin. Come on. Amen. Come on. You know what I mean? Seriously. I mean, just because they didn't show you how bad they were doesn't mean they didn't do stuff that they will never tell you about. Okay? So we all sin. We all do wrong, and we need to sin virtually because the way things are so we can figure out how bitter that is and say, I don't want any more of that in my life. Now, we say that, and then we go back and taste it again because we're still thirsty. We'll go back to it. But Romans 6, 3, and 4 says that afterwards, if we really make that change, we find that newness of life. And what is that tree do you think that's thrown into it? And we're talking spiritually now about your soul. What is the tree you think that's thrown into your situation that takes your situation in that bitterness and makes it sweet? What do you think that tree is? Unless it's the old rugged cross that's thrown into the waters of your life and suddenly your life isn't so bitter after all, right? John 16, verse 20, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Has it not? What it worth tasting? Finding out how horrible life could be and then saying, I found something sweet. 
turn into that. So if the Lord has turned the bitterness of your soul into joy and he's healed your soul, then don't forget it because you know what? There's a whole lot of folks out there that never tasted the sweet water. They've only tasted the bitter water. And that's the reason they think God's bitter. They think they're like the Egyptians. All they've seen is ten plagues. They don't know about the sweetness. They've never seen that. And you need to share with them that tree that fell into the water. So he proves that I am the Lord that heals you and he heals our souls. So he, he heals our situations, he heals our sicknesses, and he heals our souls. Now we all want it to be smooth sailing. I do, personally. I'd like there to be no bumps on the road to heaven, wouldn't you? I mean, if you just ask me, that's what I want. I don't want any rocks out there. I sure, I don't, I, so much so I want it to be so smooth that I don't even stump my toe. I've been around the edge of the bed too many times. It's not fun, amen? You know, it's just not fun. I don't even want to stump my toe. A little less do I want to break or twist my foot. I, I don't want a back problem because I fall on a rock. I don't want a broke leg. I don't want a trip to just go bad because there's too many rocks out there. I don't want a broken body. I don't want any trouble. What I really want is sweet water all the time and the road smooth and no problem. That's what we really want. And that's what we want in the Christian life. But that's not the way the Lord teaches and it's not the way he tests. You got to find some things out there that's going to do both of it to you. And he, here's the message. Man can't live by bread alone. You got to have some other stuff. And the main thing you need is not a smooth sailing. You need him. I like what Natalie Grant, that was a very point, what Natalie Grant put in her song. It's a song she wrote uh, about a year or two ago. It says, More Than Anything. It says, I know if you wanted to, you could wave your hand and spare me this headache and change your plan. And I know any second you could take my pain away but even if you don't, I pray, help me want the healer more than the healing. Help me want the savior more than the saving. Help me want the giver more than the giving. And help me want you, Jesus, more than anything. You know more than anyone that my flesh is weak. And you know I'd give anything for a remedy. And I'll ask a thousand more times to set me free today. Oh. But even if you don't, I pray, help me want the healer more than the healing. Help me to want the Savior more than saving. Help me to want the giver more than the giving. Oh, help me want you, Jesus, more than anything. And when I'm desperate and my heart's overcome, all that I need, you've already done. When I'm desperate and my heart's overcome, all I need, you've already done. Oh, Jesus, help me to want you more than anything. And then I've already got what I need. So if you seek healing, that's great. We'll try to pray for you. You just saw us do that. We'll do that every Sunday night. We'll do it special. We have special prayer things around here. We want that for you. Absolutely. Love everybody here to not have a thing wrong with you. We want that for you. But God's up to other stuff. He's not on my agenda. I'm on his. This was a test. But on the other side of the test, did you notice it? Open in your Bible just a second. Go back there to Exodus chapter 15. One more second. Exodus 15. And look at verse 27. On the other side of your test. And there will be another side of your test. Just wait and see. There will be another side of your test. And what happens? Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water. Do you think the Lord knew there were 12 tribes of Israel? There were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. Do you think the Lord knew that there were 70 elders in Israel? So they camped there by the waters. Do you think the Lord knows what you really need? So when you're going through that time, you think he doesn't know. You think he doesn't know. If you can just get through to the other side, you're going to have exactly what you need. And you know it. You've already been through those. So the next time you come tomorrow, quit thinking he doesn't know what's going on in your life. If you're here tonight and want to make your life right, that's the right thing to do. I can't guarantee you never get sick, but I guarantee you that the Lord, is the one who heals you. 
and he'll heal you tonight if you're sin sick. If you'll repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ and be baptized, you'll be healed tonight, right then. If you need to rededicate your life, we can pray with you. You'll be healed right then. If you need to come, come while we stand.